There was a major study done recently that showed that over the last couple decades, perfectionism is drastically increased. Perfectionism, of course, is the idea that I need to be or I need to appear to be perfect. Specifically, what psychologists call socially prescribed perfectionism is especially on the rise. And socially prescribed perfectionism is, it refers to the tendency for an individual to believe that others expect perfectionism from them. So with social pressures today that are constantly bombarding us with the idea that we need to have everything together all the time, we need to be the perfect mom, we need to have the perfect kids, to have the perfect tidy house, to not have any flaws, to not have any weaknesses, or if they are there, we certainly can't let them get out for the neighbors to see. And I can't help but wager that in DuPage County, in Clarendon Hills, in Hinsdale, that if that's, like if the studies show that that's happening on a macro level, I can't help but to believe that it's, it, it's, it's certainly happening here, if not even more so. And then when you look, when you go younger, the studies, at least this one, that looked at Canada, United States, and the United Kingdom, when you look younger, we see a greater struggle for youth to attain unreasonable ideals. Now there's no doubt that this has escalated due to social media of putting curated photos on social media of like not posting photos until they've been maybe put a filter on there, pressing a button, changing this shape and that, and covering up this and that after maybe it's been airbrushed and polished then posting them. I stopped by the eighth grade class on Friday just to kind of run some of this by them and kind of get their thoughts. And as I, as I shared some of this with them, over, overwhelmingly what they did was they, they, shared, they, they shared how they internalize the pressure from society that they feel that has this expectation for them to be perfect. All of that points to a false picture of humanity and living in that spot because it's not human it often leads to harmful consequences difficulties it's discouraging at worst it can be debilitating and so if if, if perfectionism or socially prescribed perfectionism is on the rise as studies show that it is we need to turn to the Bible to get the correct picture to put on biblical lenses, we need to turn to Jesus to show us how to be human. Jesus teaches us how to be human when things kind of get out of whack sometimes. And so what I wanna do is I wanna look at the second reading. The second reading you heard we're in the book of, of Hebrews. And today, chapter four, we just hear from three verses. Verses 14, 15, and 16. And these three short verses, they, they pack a powerful punch. I think a punch that we need to receive here today. So first, first verse 14, the author here has just got done telling us that now we have Jesus, a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, who sits now at the right hand of God the Father, who comes to judge the living and the dead, right, which we'll say here in the creed here in a few minutes. And it's almost as if the author knows and where our mind's going to go there. Okay, we have this great high priest who transcends into heaven, our mind thinking, okay, Jesus was here. He took on flesh, but now like he's this distant, unattainable, out of touch. So the author then goes on in verse 15 and says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way. So the first point to make here is simply this, to be human is to be weak. Because of the fall, human nature has been corrupted. So weakness goes along with being human, to have flaws, to be lacking. To be lacking is to be human. To be human is to have a bad day, to have blotches, to have wrinkles, to make mistakes, to have wounds. 
To get a B is to be human. It's to have broken areas and these wounds, maybe some because of sins that we've committed or others that have done for us, is to be broken. But if, but if in the face of the culture we live in a spot that think we need to just to not let anybody see us sweat or struggle, not just other people, but even God, then what that leads to, it's a, it's a recipe for isolation. Isolation from others, isolation from God. Because when we resort to trying to be perfect, which is not human, when we resort to trying to be perfect, pressure rises. And that pressure comes from a spot of self-reliance. When we enter into a spot of, self, of self-reliance, we enter into a spot of out of communion with God. And we enter into a spot where we're not dependent upon him, but we become dependent upon ourselves. And then there's the pressure. So people know me, right? If you, even probably you get this sense already over the last, or the first three months, I've been here three months, you get this sense, but people who, who really know me, my family, my friends, they know that I, I hold myself to a high bar. Right? Even one of the fear, first homilies that, that I gave here was the need for us to raise the bar, for us to be in tip-top shape, for us to live in a way that's worthy of, of the call that we've received. Jesus encourages that for us to have, like he has a high bar. But if I think I need to be perfect, right? And sometimes I can slip into that spot. If I think I need to be perfect, to have the perfect words, to give the perfect homily, I slip into self-reliance. And with self-reliance comes the pressure and things don't go well. It's silly. And so that's the correct picture of of humanity. We're weak. Now, the next move here in this verse is this. The author says, the Bible says, Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses. To be humans, to be weak. Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses. What the heck does that mean? It's remarkable is what it is. God who's perfect sympathizes with our struggles. Stop and hear that for a minute. The one who's, who, who's perfect, he gets me. He, 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 he sympathizes with my weaknesses and my struggles. Like even our brokenness, like see, I don't think we think that way a lot of times. So many people feel that they're too bad for God. You know, I, I hear that a lot, like even around town, you know, oh, okay, you're, you know, priest, Father Mark, where you at? Notre Dame, new priest at Notre Dame. You know, invite them over. This, you know, kind of jokingly they say, like, yeah, <laughs> Father Mark, if I came, like if, as soon as I turned around the corner and entered uh, in, the, in the doors of the church, as soon as I would enter, uh, certainly I'd get struck by lightning. And, and they, they say kind of, kind of jokingly, but you can see there's something there. A lot of people think that God can't understand their struggles. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God sympathizes with our struggles, with our weaknesses, with our brokenness. Now, I mean, in, in, in illustration of this, maybe to help us, that, to help me, you know, just, just think... Of a, of a boy who goes to a, a pet shop, right, with his mom. He goes to a pet shop. He wants to get a dog. Whole, the owner of the dog shop brings out a whole slew of dogs, five, six, seven dogs come out. And then a little bit later, there's one dog that kind of, that's lagging behind. And he's, he's, he's dragging his hind leg behind. And the boy, the little boy, points to that puppy and says, like, what's the matter with that one? And the, other, the owner tells the boy that that one's crippled because the, the hind leg doesn't have a hip socket. And the boy, boy said, he points at that one and says, well, well I, I want that one. That's the one I want. And the owner replied, like, like, no, you don't understand. You, you, you don't want that one. That one will, will never be able to, to run. It, it, it can't even walk right. He's going to be crippled forever. You don't want that one. And the boy reached down 
reached down on the floor, pulled up his pant leg, and revealed the brace. He says, the boy says, I, I don't walk all that good either. In fact, I can't run. And then looking down at the puppy, he says, the puppy will understand me, that it's not easy being crippled. <clears throat> See, because human nature is corrupted, you know, since the fall, we're, we're crippled. We, we walk with a, with, with a gimp, if you will, with, with a leg kind of dragging along. And the wild thing is, Jesus gets that. Hear that. He sympathizes with our weaknesses and with our struggles. And, and so that's why he wants to get really close to our imperfections. He can get really close to our imperfections because God took on flesh. He became human. So he wants to get right up against our imperfections. And because he's perfect, right, as that verse says, he sympathizes with our weaknesses though he knew no sin. So he is perfect. And because he's perfect, and he wants to rub right up against our imperfections, not only does he make up for our lacking, he restores. So unlike this, when the little boy pulls up his, pulls up his leg, Jesus, Jesus doesn't have that because he's perfect and he restores because he knew no sin, which is why this is the last move here. The last move here, verse 16, the last verse we heard, verse 16 says this, so then, because of everything we just heard, because of what verses 14 and 15 says, in verse 16 he says, so then, because he sympathizes with our weaknesses and our struggles and our brokenness, so then, confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. To have a God that sympathizes with our weaknesses means we ought to be running to him and saying, here are my struggles. Here's where I'm broken. Here's where I struggle. Here's my blemishes. Here's where I'm weak and here they are. We lay them at the feet of the throne of grace. And then sharing vulnerably our weaknesses with him is the exact avenue in which he longs to go deep and for us to receive intimacy with him. It's actually the best moment. It's the best avenue in which to draw close to God and have a bond. It's to the point, see, St. Paul knew this. St. Paul, as he's writing to the Corinthians in his second letter, chapter 12, he says, I'm content with my weaknesses. Paul was it. Paul was it. It, it. Not that he, he's okay sinning, but with his weakness, he knew that the power of Christ dwells. He says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So take any relationship with a friend, with a spouse. You, you think with a close friend. Think, think with your spouse. When you let them in, when you let them see your flaws, your weaknesses, your struggles, and they see it, and they still accept you? There's a crazy bond then that's formed. This person knows that, and they still love me? See, but never sharing vulnerably struggles, keeping them hid, or under wraps in any relationship, you do that in marriage, you do that in a, with a close friend, the, the relationship isn't deep. It, it, it can't go deeper. That's, that's no different with God. It's what we're made for, it's intimacy with him, this bond, this connectedness with him. To be human is to need help. To be human is to, is to be weak because of the fall. He is the one for us to place, to run to confidently his throne of grace. With confidence, we are to strive for holiness. Make no mistake about it. We are to strive for holiness, to have a high bar, but relax because you're not perfect, but he is.